How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of the Arm Scholar Podcast. In this podcast, the first one back, a lot of you guys like the reaction video that I did recently on the Tim Pool podcast and his conversation with Lucas Botkin. So for this one back, I decided to address a podcast that a lot of people had sent me when it first was released, essentially. Um, and that is a conversation that Joe Rogan had on his podcast with one of his guests. And it revolves around private party transactions of firearms. It involves so-called ghost guns, the legalities of all that, and just some conversation that happened about gun rights, the Second Amendment, and all that. So I thought I would do something similar to what I did with the Tim Pool and the Lucas Botkin conversation, add some legal context, add some you know, Second Amendment context coming from a two-way attorney, someone who follows all the cases, all the laws, and is really ingrained in the firearms community. So let's jump right into this and let's see what they're talking about. You scare me sometimes with your dangerous adventures, like real boots on the ground, investigative journalism. Yeah. Oof. We've been all over the world. Uh, I think last time I was here was two years ago. Yeah. Last time you had ago. just gotten back from the cocaine manufacturing yeah. in the jungle, mm -hmm. which was wild. Yeah. And then you took a backpack with mm -hmm. the stuff and traveled yeah, with the... Right. Oof. And since I've reported on a lot other drugs and other crazy situations, and uh, we're now doing, actually already filming season four. Wow. Season three is coming out. Tell right people now. where to get it and what it's so, called. So yeah, it's uh, Trafficked with Mariana Van Zeller. It's on National Geographic next day on Hulu, and it's on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. And it's about black markets. So it's illegal markets around the world, whether it's drugs, guns, fight clubs, uh, I mean, anything, surrogacy, illegal surrogacy. So again, I want to stop it right there. This whole conversation is kind of starting from the fact that she makes documentaries and, and a TV series, uh, I think for National Geographic, and it sounds like it also plays on Hulu, about black markets and what she's claiming is like illegal trafficking. And so she's going to talk about her perspective as far as so-called ghost guns and private party transactions of firearms and maybe how that plays into what she believes is illegal trafficking. Now, I think there are some things that are conflated in this conversation. Um, some things are misrepresented, uh, when Joe asks some questions and this is not a knock on her. I think, um, you know, I don't know her. I don't know her work really. Um, my goal is not necessarily ever to berate anybody, but just to have an open conversation from my perspective, coming from the two way legal world as a two way attorney, um, coming from someone who makes, you know, two way content here on YouTube and on social media and all that. And, um, you following legal cases about these topics and knowing all the legal intricacies, just trying to add more context. Um, and maybe Joe will see this one day and, you know, maybe he'll get filled in with more with some of those questions that he was asking her that I think weren't fully answered or maybe were um, conflated or misrepresented in some way. So that's kind of the goal. But, uh, you know, I do take a little issue with, you know, framing this whole issue of so-called ghost guns into illegal marketing and, uh, you know, Tra trafficking and, and things like you know, illegal markets. I think um, that's conflating some issues, uh, but you know, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that as they have the conversation more. To me was the getting the guns in America and transporting them to Mexico, mm -hmm. that that is going on and then it's going on with cops. It is. Uh, it is. For me, it's always been, I think the first story I did on guns in America was about 12, 15 years ago where I was able to buy an AK-47 out of a, a Taco Bell parking lot <laughs> in Arizona. Where else? And, <laughs> where else than in Arizona? <laughs> and then the funny thing I meant that where happened, else but a, a Taco Bell parking oh, yeah, lot. Oh, of course. <laughs> Both those things. Of course. <laughs> and then we went to a bar to sort of celebrate the fact that we just filmed this crazy thing that just happened because we, we knew it was possible that people were doing this, but we wanted to show it with our camera. So we had sort of secret cameras filming, and then I went out, and I bought it, and we went out to a bar after... Uh, and I ordered a beer, and I, I forgot my driver's license, so <laughs> didn't give me a beer. That's hilarious. Isn't that funny? So no beer, but you, I could go out with a naked 47. And a few days later, we bought a 50 cal out of a guy's garage that we went out into the desert and filmed. Women and like shot. it. So I want to stop there. There was There's two things I want to cover. So the first one is in regards to she talks about, uh, you know, Joe references in this TV series, which I'm going to try to dig it up and find it. Uh, they talk about... Uh, firearms being sold from law enforcement, making their way, you know, across the borders, potentially getting in the hands of cartel. And they, they cover this a little bit later in this conversation. Um, and one thing I want to kind of clarify in that, I think it's interesting, and I'm curious what statistics they pulled or what evidence they pulled for that stuff. But we all know, especially here in the two-way community, because we've covered it quite a bit, um, there's been a lot of discussion about it. But one of the biggest, I guess, perpetrators of 
selling firearms or putting them in the hands of other countries and other, you know, criminals in other countries is the federal government and the ATF. There was a whole, you know, Fast and Furious program under Obama and his administration, you know, giving these firearms to the cartel and they made their ways in the hands of cartels and they're found at, you know, crime scenes in countries like Mexico. So in my point of view, it's not like, and I would be interested to see, you know, what evidence they have for this and what statistics they have for this. It's not like your local PD, you know, person running the, you know, normal beat at your, you know, your town or your city are the ones that are, getting these firearms or these so-called ghost guns and then, you know, selling them to the cartel. You know, technically a, a big majority of these firearms are making their way into the hands of these criminals in other countries, probably through the hands of our own, you know, agencies like the ATF. We know that they've run programs like that where that's expressly what they do. So it's interesting that, you know, that's brought up as maybe one of the bigger issues in relation to so-called ghost guns. And I think it's more of an issue that's been caused by our own government, not necessarily just like your local law enforcement agencies. It's it's a much bigger systemic issue, <laughs> you know, perpetrated by potentially executive agencies that also, on the other hand, are actively trying to restrain law-abiding citizens like me and you, our ability to access firearms and to access these specific type of firearms that we're talking about, like 80 percenters, unfinished frames and receivers. Uh, so we'll cover that a little bit later going into this deeper with the ATF's rule on frames and receivers, the restrictions on so-called ghost guns and 80 percenters and all that, which wasn't covered at all during this conversation, which is interesting when you're having an entire conversation about so-called ghost guns and the legality of it. You know, I think this podcast took place maybe four months ago. And as we all know, the ATS rule on frames and receivers was very much in place. There's been litigation going on against it, but it wasn't mentioned at all by this individual during this conversation with Joe Rogan. The next thing she's talking about, and one of the main things that they first talk about is private party transactions. Now they're talking about, you know, selling a gun or purchasing a gun in a Taco Bell parking lot. Now, I, you know, it sounds goofy when you say it like that. And it, of course, it's framed in a very specific way during this conversation, I'm sure during this TV show to make it seem more dramatic than what it is. But it's simply what this is, is, you know, there are federal laws, um, but there is no federal law against someone selling their own personal property, their own firearm that they purchased, and then selling it to another individual who wants to purchase that. There is no federal law against that. There are some restrictions as far as you can't sell it to someone who you know is a felon or a prohibited person, then you could have criminal culpability for doing that. But, you know, overarching, it's just simply a private party transaction. Now, this is where you have the anti-gun side talk about this in the context of the gun show loophole, though, the scary gun show loophole. Essentially, all they're talking about is private party transactions. And they talk about that in the context because they want to introduce the other bu buzzword that they have, which is universal background checks. So they talk about we need universal background checks. Now, when the layman hears the term universal background check, you know, we need it to close the gun show loophole. What they think is like there are no background checks. But we have background checks. Uh, we have the, you know, the NICS system, the 4473s, all of that background checks are run on the traditional, you know, if you walk into a gun store, you want to purchase a firearm from a gun store, you know, they have to run a background check on you. Same thing at a gun store. If you're purchasing a firearm from someone who's at a gun show and they're an FFL and you're purchasing it from them, you would have to run a background. Now, where they talk about the gun show loophole or where it's being framed in this context of buying a firearm out of a Taco Bell parking lot. Uh, that is just simply a private party transaction where one person is selling the personal property to another person, similar to, I guess, if I wanted to sell my vehicle to someone else, they wanted to purchase it. We wouldn't have to go through an auto dealer or have the government get involved in that because I'm just simply selling my personal property from myself to someone else. So, and of course, firearms have a different connotation because, you know, we're talking about a fundamental right, your right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment. Um, you know, the Second Amendment protects our fundamental right of self-defense and defense against tyranny, both foreign and domestic. So, you know, it doesn't give us that right. It just simply prevents the government from infringing on that right. So to frame this as something like this is out of the norm to be able to purchase a firearm in a Taco Bell, you know, parking lot, I think is conflating some things, making it a little more dramatic than what it really is. And I know, you know, there are plenty of people who have purchased firearms, you know, through, various websites or come in contact with a friend who wants to sell it and they engage through private party transactions. Um, you know, I, I know my wife, you know, when she buys stuff, not firearms, but when she wants to buy stuff, you know, through Facebook marketplace or whatever, 
you know, she meets with someone in what she deems to be a safe location so they can get engaged in that transaction, you know, Walmart parking lot, Target parking lot, maybe even a Taco Bell parking lot would be viable as well. I think that if when you frame it in that context, in the real world context, it's not as weird sounding as what it really is. Um, and also, I just want to add some further legal context. You know, we have those overarching federal, you know, laws where they don't necessarily prohibit this. But then you also have state laws. For example, I'm in the state of California where we have our firearms precursor part laws and the firearms precursor part vendor licensing and all that to where um, if you want to purchase something like an 80 percenter, you would have to go through an FFL dealer where they run the background check. And then also we have our par private party transaction restrictions to where if I want to purchase a firearm through a par private party transaction like this, I would be mandated to have to go through an FFL where they would charge additional transfer fees, the additional California droves fee, and then also it would be subject to the 10 day waiting period because of all these additional restrictions that the state of California puts on that specific type of transaction. So to just simply make it sound like this is um, the norm across the US where you could just purchase any gun you want in a Taco Bell parking lot, um, for majority states, that's how it is and that's how it should be in my opinion. Um, but you do have other states that have restrictions like in the state of California, which hopefully we get rid of those restrictions as far as the private party transaction restrictions. Um, and then the other thing I want to address here, the last thing before we move on to the rest of this video is, you know, she keeps mentioning, you know, I bought an AK-47 or I bought an AR or a, and I, I was offered a, a, you know, a 50 cal. To me, this just sounds like using a lot of buzzwords. But when you, again, take this back down to the common firearms owner base, you know, the average law abiding person who loves firearms, loves to exercise their second amendment rights, purchasing something like an AK, purchasing something like an AR or a 50 BMG, something like that, you know, a desert Eagle, whatever, um, whatever she's referencing there. It's really not out of the norm, especially when you're talking about like AKs and ARs, um, especially ARs and AKs, they're semi-automatic center fire rifles, and they are some of the most commonly owned and possessed firearms across the entire US. So for someone to purchase one of those originally, like an AK or AR, very common. You know, I have tons of ARs, I have AKs. It's very common. Again, almost every gun owner owns one of those. So very common that someone would traditionally buy one of those, maybe get sick of it, not want it, not like that specific one don't like how it functions, maybe just want to get rid of it for some extra cash to maybe buy something else. And then decide like, hey, I want to sell it to someone else. I don't want to have to deal with the fuss with going through the gun store. You know, there's no reason for that. This person I know, my friend or whoever, um, you know, maybe just someone off one of these websites wants to purchase this. Again, not out of the norm and someone very much frequently would like to purchase ARs. It happens, you know, millions are sold every single day. So really not out of the norm that that would type of situation would happen. And also in my opinion, probably not out of the norm that you would meet somewhere that's very public, like, you know, a Taco Bell parking lot or a McDonald's or Walmart or Target or somewhere like that. So again, just trying to add some additional context, because I think when you add it back down to the real world context of how the laws and how this really functions for the everyday gun owner it doesn't sound as dramatic as she's trying to make it seem when they get carded of course we do yeah <laughs> it's not unfortunately I don't get carded as often nowadays. Well, it's just ridiculous you know <laughs> come on i guess they have to i mean but whatever I mean, oh come it's, on. it's crazy i know it's 21 I come know. on it's, i know look at me but this was 12 years ago so it's possible possible <laughs> yeah um how hard is it to buy an ak-47 like, it was so it, easy we went online at the time i can't remember what the name of the website backpage at the time there's a website, website called backpage where you could essentially buy anything i don't think that website exists anymore but it's not even on the black market regular online uh, website and we went there and within i, I think we spoke to the again she's so it's not even on the black market because again it's not le illegal it's not federally not illegal to be engaged in these types of transactions. Um, she, she inserts that a few times where I think, again, wants to make it sound maybe a little bit more dramatic than what it really is. Uh, again, saying, well, an AK, what, you know, how easy was it to buy an AK? I would, I would guarantee you probably a lot of these private party transactions that are being engaged in are probably sales between, you know, selling ARs, AKs, and probably like handguns like Glocks are probably some of the most common things that are sold during private party transactions because they are the most commonly owned and possessed firearms we have in the U.S. The guy 20 minutes before, he said, meet us here. We went there. It was him and his girlfriend were there. He was high on drugs. Oh, and boy. He had two, and he had an AR-15 with him as well that he was also wanting to sell. We ended up buying the AK. Um, but, yeah, so I've been fascinated with sort of 
um, how easy it is. How do you know he was high on drugs? Because you could tell. I've, I've reported enough on drugs. And Meth, you think? At the time, probably. He was very jittery. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely an upper of sorts. Jesus. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, so then we decided to do this for the first season, actually, of Traffic, to story on guns and how American guns are winding up in the hands of the cartel in Mexico and how it's responsible for so much of the violence that's happening there. And sort of this cycle, which I don't think most people think about, how then the violence leads people to immigrate to America and then they come here and, you know, so it's like a cycle of... of so again, just kind of going back to a couple of things she said, where she's talking about how this individual's jittery, probably was on drugs. How true that is, I don't know. A lot of that again could be conflated for just the, you know, this, you know, for the story to make it seem more dramatic. I don't know about you, but if I had someone, you know, I, I was contacting someone online, um, wanted to sell one of my firearms, and then they show up and they're doing a documentary, I'd probably be pretty jittery. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, probably still wouldn't engage in that transaction. I would think it's probably like a setup of some weird sort, even though I'm not doing anything illegal. Um, so, you know, I don't know how true that is. And then she goes back to talking about how a lot of these guns are ending up in the hands of the cartel. I would just say you need to look into the ATS fast and furious policy. That's where a lot of those firearms came from. And, and it's not these types of transactions that are leading to that. Um, it's not these private party transactions. It's not these 80 percenters or these polymer 80s or any or 3D printed firearms that are causing that type of scenario. Um, it's something else that's going on. And it's mainly because of some policies that were put in place by executive agencies like the ATF, who've engaged in specific policies that led to cartels and criminal individuals in other countries coming into possession of firearms that were confiscated by those agencies in the U.S. and then ended up or were put in the hands of those other individuals. Violence and immigration, it's all, and guns, and it's all sort of connected. But whenever we do a story on guns, and we just, one, another one that I did on ghost guns was released last week on National Geographic. And uh, it is the most sort of controversial issue, the hot topic that we can always. So I immediately start getting messages of people saying that I should go back to my country and uh, what am I doing? And I'm trying to take away people's rights to own a gun, which is absolutely not the case. And it's... Uh, yeah. So I, again, I just want to stop there. I think it, it, of course, firearms is a very, very controversial topic. It's a very hot topic. Um, because you're talking about, especially when you're talking about in the context of the U S fundamental right, in, you know, protected from government overreach in the second amendment, it's a fundamental human right, in my opinion, you know, whether or not you have the second amendment or not. Um, and that's why it's such a hot topic. Now, I think she's being respectful. She doesn't seem like a, a ravenous anti-gunner like you would traditionally see. I think just maybe some things were spun for the purpose of maybe creating a more dramatic story for the show that she was she was making um and make it sound a little bit more dramatic for this conversation she's having with joe rogan um i never necessarily i don't i don't condone like attack so yeah, attacking people or anything like that so in no way is this video intended to be attacking her it's just my goal is to add further context you know from our side from the pro 2a side from the gun rights side from the 2a legal side adding further context in this conversation, especially because Joe Rogan's asking a lot of questions and seems like he's very curious about this topic and wants good information, wants accurate information, and probably wants the full story. And so my goal would be to provide that. I don't think this would ever make it to him. I don't know. But for you guys who are listening, um, just kind of understand the conversation that goes on sometimes and just add further context to this. Yeah, it's the idea that people wouldn't want to know that police officers are confiscating guns and then selling those guns to the Mexican cartel that you as a legal law abiding gun owner mm -hmm. in America wouldn't want that exposed. Yeah, absolutely. It's and and that the guns that people are buying and particularly with this last episode on ghost guns, which is the fact that the guns are, that are now these untraceable and licensed guns are so easy to make and they're Okay, before they get into the whole, because now they're going to shift into the ghost gun conversation or the so-called ghost gun conversation and what exactly that is and what that buzzword is. Um, you know, Joe's asking, you know, why wouldn't law abiding gun owners want the fact that cartel are getting these firearms into their hands because of illegal acts by law enforcement? Why wouldn't they want that exposed? We absolutely do want that exposed, especially, you know, 
That's why the whole ATF Fast and Furious policy and the Obama administration, you know, policy, we wanted that blown up everywhere. Um, and if other agencies are engaged in that, whether they're state, local, you know, federal, if they're engaged in those types of activities, we definitely want that exposed. But to say that this is an issue being caused by the firearms themselves um, because of these dangerous so-called ghost guns, that's just simply not true. Again, I'm going to go back to the fact that a lot of these firearms that are winding up in the hands of cartel are because of one specific federal agency and a specific policy that was engaged in, which led to that. So many of them are ending up in crime scenes across America and on the hands of gang members and, you know, militant groups and anti-government groups. And it's it's scary. And that's all we're, what we're trying to do as a journalist myself when we decided to do the stories, because I started hearing from people talking about how these guns are ending up in the wrong place. And how do they make a ghost gun? It is. I'm happy you're asking that because I think it's the biggest uh, people don't understand out there. They think that when you talk about ghost guns, that it has to be 3D printed. It's not. A ghost gun is an untraceable gun. doesn't mean that it has to be 3D printed. Um, however, nowadays, it's basically, a, a, so it's a gun that doesn't have a serial number. And it could have had a serial So I, I do appreciate this definition she gave for this because it is accurate. And a lot of times you will not get the actual accurate definition or, or framing of what they believe to be a so-called ghost gun or what they try to put under that umbrella. Now, again, ghost gun is not a legal definition. There is no specific defined definition. You know, there is no definition of what a ghost gun is. That is not a legal definition. That is not something that has been set and put in place by our government. Um, you have some states that call them um, firearms precursor parts. You have, you know, California has the firearms precursor part law. You have the ATS rule on frame, unfinished frames and receivers. So sometimes they'll call them unfinished frames and receivers. Um, they're sometimes referred to as 80 percenters, 3D printed firearms, but she's accurate. At least she's giving an accurate definition of a lot of times what they're putting under that entire umbrella is unserialized, you know, frames or receivers. And typically what that is when she's referencing that these are found at crime scenes, the statistics show that those types of firearms that are considered so-called ghost guns and are being found at, you know, certain rates at these crime scenes, they tend to be just traditional firearms that were made and purchased through traditional means, like through FFLs, and then maybe were stolen by a criminal. And then the serial number was scratched off. The firearm was defaced in some way so that the serial number is removed and then, you know, it falls under that broad classification of a so-called ghost gun. And then it's used by that criminal at the, you know, crime and it's found at that crime. And they're just saying, okay, we found a ghost gun there, but it's not a 3D printed firearm. It's not a polymer 80 or an 80 percent or anything like that. Um, it's just simply a traditional, most of the time, a traditional handgun that's had its serial number removed by a criminal who likely stole it. Serial number and the serial number was scrubbed and maybe they put a new fake serial number in there. Um, and, but I want to stop there. No, most of the time, I've never seen it. Most of the time when a criminal steals a firearm, scrapes it off, they're not putting a fake one on there. They're just defacing it. Um, I don't know where that came from. Maybe she's, she's saying that when people 3d print some firearms, maybe they put a serial number on it because of certain ATF rules or state laws. Um, maybe that's what she's referencing there, but you know, if someone's actually removing a serial number that already existed on there, they're not then going to put on a different one. What happens is because of the 3D printers, um, it's now super easy to just print a gun or gun parts at home. So there are all these companies out there who sell 80% kits that have everything to build a gun except for the receiver. But there's a company, for example, called Defense Distributed, ran by Cody Wilson. Okay, so we're going to get in some more nitty gritties as she's talking about some of these things. Um, First thing I want to address, she says, you know, with 3D printing, it's super easy to make these firearms. Now, 3D printing is awesome technology. Um, I think 3D printing itself and that practice implicates not only your Second Amendment right, but your First Amendment right. You know, there's a whole movement of, you know, you can't stop the code. Um, and I'm by no means am I an expert on 3D printing. I don't engage in 3D printing on my own. Um, but I do know from people who engaged in, you know, 3D printing of firearms, which again, um, federally is legal. There are some restrictions on certain states and things like that. Um, but 
it's not as easy as like, I'm just going to turn on this machine, put in this code and it's going to do it all for me. Um, I've seen plenty of images on Twitter, Instagram, videos, et cetera, where the process of actually getting the 3D printing process in a 3D printed, you know, frame, receiver, whatever, correct is not very easy. You know, and there are people in the two-way community that dedicate, you know, a lot of time, a lot of effort into doing 3D printing and getting it right because it's just not simple. Now, I'm sure once you hone those skills and you get everything right, you get your settings right, and you really spend a lot of time doing that, it becomes easier and easier. But for the layman, it's not as simple as just buying a machine off of Amazon, turning it on, and then all now all of a sudden you got all these things. Um, so again, I think that's conflating some things. But then also she's talking about, you know, you could just, all you need is you can go to these other companies and get all these parts. Well, yes, you can get parts from any online. You can walk into a gun store and buy parts. You can go to, you know, Brownells or whoever else is your online seller and buy parts because a barrel is not a firearm. A slide is not a firearm. A trigger is not a firearm. So it's never been illegal for you to purchase parts. Um, so I'm not really sure where that's coming from. Maybe she is familiar a little bit with the ATF's rules where they're trying to regulate parts kits and throw parts kits and unfinished frames and receivers and jigs and instructions into this overarching definition of what a frame or receiver or an unfinished frame receiver is. Um, and I think this is a good place to talk about something that was not addressed at all, which is the ATS rule on frames and receivers, which is a little perplexing because again, the ATF released that rule and it was in place during this conversation, I believe. So why it was not part of this conversation, I'm not sure, but the ATF introduced a new rule on frames and receivers, which is essentially a federal new regulation on 80 percenters, unfinished frames and receivers, or what people commonly call so-called ghost guns. And what the ATF tried to do is re rewrite the federal laws you know, through executive fiat on their own, change the rule, go back on some of the statements that they had made for many years saying that, you know, a polymer 80 or an 80 percenter or these kits that they were not frames or receivers and therefore they were not considered as firearms. So th that's also important context because it's not even just to say that when something is considered to be a frame or receiver, that means it also meets the federal definition that that piece of plastic or that piece of metal on its own under federal law is considered to actually be a firearm without any other components in it, without a slide or a barrel or even being functional. The fact that it's just a frame on its own or a receiver on its own, that makes it a firearm in its own right. So that was kind of the whole issue with the ATS rolling frames and receivers is they wanted to broaden that definition to include and encapsulate more things into what they could define to be an actual firearm and therefore regulate more stringently and, you know, force serialization requirements on it. And also the context with that is it wasn't, so it went in place, I believe in August of last year, but any 80% or you purchased before that wasn't affected. It was only those that were going to be in you know, purchased or sold going forward. So which added some further confusion about things and some further issues where they were saying, we're only going to call these things that are sold after this date an actual firearm, but all these other things that are identical sold prior to this, we're going to say, no, we're not going to consider those to be firearms. Only if they potentially made their way in the hands of FFLs or are resold, then we're going to put in place all these other restrictions. So, I mean, that's the whole ATS rule on frames receivers, you know, in broad overview. But that's all to say, also recently what we found out with the Vanderstock ruling from a federal district court judge, Reed O'Connor, in reviewing the ATF rulemaking process where they essentially passed this new law, which executive agencies like the ATF are not supposed to create laws, um, which that's what they did. But the judge there said that that was improper, the ATF overstepped their authority. They overstepped their ability to engage in that type of conduct. And therefore, he vacated the entire rule. Now, that's going to be litigated, I'm sure, even further up to the Fifth Circuit. The ATF is probably not going to just let that law sit. But we've already had a federal district court judge look at the rulemaking process of the ATF and their attempts to regulate these items under federal law and says no. And that judge said no. Looking at the law, it is invalid for the ATF to do that. Um, at least under current federal laws. Um, he didn't address the Second Amendment context because 
you know, at the first step of whether or not the ATF could even do it, he found that they couldn't. So he didn't even have to get into the Second Amendment implications. Then who was the first one to use a ghost gun uh, or a gun, a 3D printed gun, actually, it was called the Liberator. And uh, he got in all sorts of trouble. The with, Liberator. Yeah. It's also funny that she mentions Defense Distributed because Defense Distributed is one of the uh, plaintiffs that's part of, I believe, that Vanderstock lawsuit. And so Defense Distributed actually was part of the plaintiff's uh, I believe they were one of the intervener plaintiffs who won in the Vanderstock lawsuit. So it's just interesting that she's mentioning defense distributed and didn't talk about the ATF rule or the lawsuits or anything like that. Again, that Vanderstock lawsuit existed at the time, I believe, of this podcast. And he's a strong believer in, um, he said he wanted this, to his, his company to be sort of the WikiLeaks for guns so that everybody could have access to guns. So he sells these kits that are 80% kits and it's all, everything you need to buy a gun except. And I'm going to be stopping this a lot. There's not a whole lot left, but the other thing that doesn't go addressed at all, she meant she, she kind of hits on it a little bit there um, is the first amendment implications. Um, because the certain restrictions that they would like to put in place on things like 3d printers has first amendment implications. Now the ATF, when they first proposed their new restrictions on unfinished frames and receivers, they were going to try and target 3D printing, but they ended up dropping that when they put in place the final rule. And I think because they anticipated that there was going to be heavy litigation against it. And they also didn't want to have to fight this rule on First Amendment grounds on, you know, the, the dissemination of speech and, you know, the implications of speech and all that in this specific context. So the ATF didn't even touch 3D printers. Um, they, they touched it in some context as far as I believe um, if you created something 3D printed and you want to try to resell it and you, I guess, put it in the hands of an FFL. I think there was something like that in the rule, but the broader restrictions that they initially, I guess, wanted to put in place on 3D printers ended up getting dropped. Um, so again, interesting that the First Amendment context isn't mentioned, but now they're going to get into like, I guess, what exactly is an 80 percenter or I guess maybe what some people would like to call a so-called ghost gun. And here they're, she's more referencing things like polymer 80s or things made by like 80 percent arms. For the lower receiver, which is what the ATF and the government actually considers to be the gun. What part is the lower receiver? It depends on which weapon, I believe, but it's the bottom on the guns that he's selling, it's sort of the bottom piece. Oh, okay. Um, uh, there's the liberator. Yeah, that is a liberator. Yeah, so this is all 3D printed. And he had he showed so that's me that's an actual gun, that plastic that thing. That is. And you know somebody it, pulled that on me, I'd be skeptical. And this so was several hey. years ago. It's evolved <laughs> a lot. It's evolved a lot since then. Yeah. 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 Those guns. Wow. Yeah. So that's a real gun, that yeah. plastic thing? Yeah. And so, but what, now, but yeah, but if you want to yeah. see some of the new ones these and what they're guns. making, yeah, and now, they, these are also ghost guns. And some of so she's for those of you who are listening, she's pointing at some pictures and they're looking at some pictures of, I guess, probably just searching or Jamie's just searching, you know, ghost guns or pictures of ghost guns or maybe liberators or, or something like that. I think what she's pointing out right now, it doesn't necessarily maybe look like, I mean, they could just be firearms without serial numbers, they could be like polymer 80s. Um, I think jo when Joe's asking, you know, which part is actually the firearm, you know, it's traditionally the frame or the receiver. That's what's, you know, under that definition of what a firearm is. And it seems like he has some questions about, you know, you know, how does this really work? Um, again, not saying like, I mean, of course I would love to be on the podcast, but I wish someone was there during this conversation who actually understood like, you know, how polymer 80s or those types of kits work where you have a 80%, you know, frame of a handgun that looks maybe like something like a, a Glock. And there's still some tooling that needs to take place. And then the fact that you need to add additional parts, um, which again, are not regulated at all, like your slide, your barrel, your trigger control group, magazines, iron sights, all that. You still have to build the firearm out. Um, but as you get it from the companies, it's simply just a piece of plastic that needs some additional drilling and modifications that need to actually be made to it so that it can even function. Because as it's sold to you, it is not a functional anything. Um, you know, it's kind of an over glorified paperweight at that point until you actually modify it and add all the additional parts and do the additional um, modifications to it. So it'll actually operate. Um, and it seems like, I think he has some questions about, you know, they can make the metal. And I think he's going to talk about that right now. 
some of that is metal. So what is it? Where do some they of get it is the metal. metal parts? It can be all 3D printed. Some of it is metal. So you can buy it from companies like Hoodie Wilson's. And then they 3D print metal. Oh, nowadays, yes, you can. Really? You can have a. It's like a polyamer. Uh, what's the? I can't remember. Polymer. It's, polymer. Sorry, polymer uh, material that is. Yeah, that that that's what a lot of the guns are actually like made a of. carbon fiber yeah. or something. Because mm-hmm. I've seen carbon mm-hmm. fiber. So. Again, just adding some further context of how this traditionally operates. When you're buying from someone like Polymer 80 Defense Distributed or 80% Arms, usually what you're getting is you would get a kit with the jig and it would have that unfinished frame in it, like, you know, similar to a Glock clone. And it'll have, you know, your drill bits, your jig, some instructions. And then you would need to go purchase other items, you know, your slide, your barrel. Sometimes they sell those kits as well on those same websites to where you could kind of have the full kit and be able to build it out. Um, but it's not like you're 3D printing the whole thing. Now, when it comes to 3D printing, there are, you know, some guys that heavy 3D print of quite a bit of the firearm. Um, but traditionally, you would have like the barrel would be a piece you would buy, the triggers, the bolts, all of that um, would be additional, just simply parts that you would purchase. There were barrels for hunting rifles. They make them very light so that people can take them mm-hmm. into the back country when they go deep yeah. into the woods. There's all the kind of parts you can make with wow. 3D printing metal stuff. Oh, one of the craziest things we filmed for this Ghost Gun episode was actually this: these teenagers that were also making uh, 3D and ghost guns, and they came to the desert with us, and we spent a whole day with them shooting guns and showing us what they build. And they were also uh, making drop-in sears, which are little pieces to that transform a gun from semi-automatic to fully automatic. Mm. And they're illegal, actually, in America. You can't buy that at a gun store. So, yeah, there at that last section, she's talking about, you know, she went out, I believe, during this TV series with some kids is what she calls them. I'm, again, I'm not sure I didn't watch the TV series. I'll try to find it um, that they 3D printed some firearms and they went out and shot them again. Not illegal to do. I believe if she's referencing maybe in Arizona. I don't think it's illegal to you know 3D print firearms in, in Arizona. It's not like, you know, California. Um, but then she talks about, you know, the 3d printing auto sears, which, you know, is very illegal federally, which if these kids went out there and did that on camera during a documentary with this lady <laughs> that blows my mind again, very, very illegal federally. Um, I don't agree with that. I think you should be able to have machine guns. I don't, you know, the whole basis of the gun control act and the NFA and restrictions on you know, machine guns, all that stuff. I think the basis behind that was overblown for putting in place those restrictions and um, hopefully some challenges to those go through and some challenges, the NFA and the GCA and some of those machine guns restrictions and all that um, end up getting rid of those laws. But, you know, I, again, I think it's, it's a good story for her to sell to say about, you know, these kids 3d printing those auto sears Um, you know, no doubt people do that, but people do things that are deemed illegal often. Um, So, you know, I don't really know how that adds to the story, you know, people do illegal things people steal firearms from people as well when which is criminal conduct and they shouldn't do that so again hopefully i just added some further context to this conversation on so-called ghost guns and private party transactions again in no way am i trying to attack this lady um you know i think it's a it's a valuable conversation that i'm glad they had on the joe rogan podcast because again it's the biggest podcast we have in the world in any conversation about gun rights firearms the second amendment is important um hopefully this added some additional context from someone who's in the 2a world who's in the firearms world who's a 2a attorney who's worked with national organizations who's really tied into these issues these cases these laws hopefully that just added some additional clarification and who knows by you know maybe the grace of god or you know weird happenstances ends up you know in front of joe rogan and he gets further education on what you know this really all entails and how that really plays with everything so hopefully this added some additional context and was valuable to you guys. And if you like this type of information, um, we can keep doing it. If you guys have um, some recommendations of other conversations, maybe like this that happened on maybe some other podcasts or with some other people about firearms and gun laws and gun rights and the second amendment, uh, shoot those over to me. You can follow me over on Instagram or Twitter, arm scholar YT, and you can, you know, send those videos over to me, send those links to me, and maybe I'll use them for a podcast. But regardless, thank you guys so much for all of your support. If you guys are listening to this over on Spotify, Apple, Google, somewhere like that, if you're listening to the podcast, make sure you leave reviews because that really helps the analytics over on the audio side. Um, But again, thank you guys so much for all of your support. 
Thank you guys for the support for the podcast. And as always, this nation was built by armed scholars and this nation will be maintained by armed scholars.